Hi, I'm Evan. And I'm Caleb. And we're here to talk about graph representation techniques. Graphs are powerful data structures that can be used to model a wide range of complex phenomena, from social ties and communication pathways to drug behavior and protein-protein interactions. By analyzing social graphs, we can identify communities, recommend friendships, and even predict social interactions. Similarly, from drug and protein interaction networks, we can model and predict both the solutions and side effects of specific drug combinations. To draw such valuable insights from network data, computer scientists turn to machine learning algorithms for classification and regression. These algorithms take numerical features as inputs, not entire graphs. So an important first step is to decide how we will compute and represent network properties for any given node or edge. We might decide to hand select our features for our specific tasks, but this is often tedious and inefficient. Can we find a better, more generalized approach? We can. The solution is known as representation learning. The big idea behind representation learning is to embed our nodes into a low-dimensional vector space where we encode some notion of network similarity. Each node or edge is given a unique set of coordinates, and from the relative positions we can find clusters or even compute similarities between points using dot products. These embeddings also give us a better way to visualize massive graphs. Using dimensionality reduction techniques from linear algebra, we can plot the points in a two-dimensional Cartesian plane to understand their distribution. And once we feed our embedded data into machine learning models, we can begin to classify nodes or predict missing edges. But to choose an embedding, we must ask, how will we encode network similarity? Maybe we want to find connected components or identify shared neighbors. Maybe we're interested in hubs or authorities, local bridges or other structural similarity measures. Different embedding methods have different advantages, and we'll consider a few popular embedding methods in this video. In this section, we're going to be talking about factorization techniques to generate a graph embedding. In a factorization approach, a graph representation is taken as an input. Then, linear algebra techniques are used to generate a low-dimensional representation of the nodes. These linear algebra techniques are advantageous because the methodology is really well understood, unlike, for example, deep learning. Um, and to approach this subject, we're first briefly going to talk about some graph representations and their advantages. And then we're going to, we'll go over a couple algorithms that can be viewed as representative of the broad field of graph factorization techniques. To perform linear algebra techniques and get our low-dimensional embeddings, we first need a matrix representation of the graph. For this, there are a couple different options. One basic one is the node adjacency matrix, which shows edges or edges and edge weights for a graph. A basic variant that provides a little more information is the Laplacian matrix, L, defined as L equals D minus A, where D is a diagonal matrix with the degrees of each node. A variation of this is the normalized Laplacian. One can extend the idea of the adjacency matrix even further using the cat similarity matrix, which uses the adjacency mat matrix to measure how central each node is by factoring, pun intended, neighbors of neighbors, and so on into the equation. Next, we consider the node transition probability matrix. With this representation, we analyze how a graph changes as a probabilistic Markov chain. One way to find it is d inverse times a. The idea here is that the matrix shows the probability that a node will transition to another state. Think of this as information or something being propagated through the network. Finally, we consider the PMI matrix, which defines how associated two node elements are with each other. Now that we have a couple different representations in our tool belt, we'll turn to and focus on a couple of the algorithms themselves. The first algorithm we'll talk about is called locally linear embeddings. The use of this algorithm carries a couple assumptions with it. First, we assume that the graph representation matrix columns lie on or near a low dimensional manifold. This is not an unreasonable assumption, as recently this has been shown to be true for many data sets. Next, we assume that the nodes lie on or close to a locally linear patch in the manifold. You can think of this as, as assuming we can reconstruct an arbitrary node if we are given the nodes around it. These assumptions segue into our algorithm, which begins by finding a linear com transformation W that will represent each graph element as a linear combination of its neighbors. We're going to use this matrix to generate a low dimensional embedding Y by minimizing the objective function. Essentially, we are defining an embedding that preserves the local linearity in the original representation. The advantages here are that it is invariant to translation, rotation, and rescaling, uh, properties which are important for a graph. And by enforcing restrictions on the variance of the solution and centering the vectors around the origin, we can reduce this objective function to a very solvable eigenproblem. However, there are disadvantages to this approach. First, if the assumptions are wrong, obviously, especially the local linearity, then this algorithm will fail. In addition, while this approach is very good at preserving local dissimilarity, it is not very good at preserving local similarity or global properties. Two variants, the Laplacian eigenmaps and the Cauchy graph embeddings, can be used to focus more on preserving local similarity or global properties, respectively. In preserving local and global information for network embedding, the authors come up with objective function goals for both the local and global part of the problem and solve the coupled problem. However, they can't solve the coupled objective function with linear algebra and have to appeal to an optimization technique called stochastic gradient descent instead. One appealing alternative to factorization methods is random walks. They are an excellent choice for capturing neighborhood similarity and community membership. 
and the random walk strategy allows for efficient computation time since we don't need to consider every node-node relationship. Lastly, this method is conceptually very straightforward. Beginning with each target node, a number of paths can be formed by iteratively selecting neighboring nodes, each with some assigned probability. These are our random walks. The goal here is to transform the graph structure into a collection of linear sequences. For each node, we will be left with a list of other nodes from their local or extended neighborhoods. Once we have this random walk data, we plan to implement a variation on the popular word to vec algorithm, which comes from the language modeling community. A word to vec model is a simple two-layer neural network typically used to encode words using the example sentences that they appear in. Given a target word, the model is trained to predict other words that should appear nearby. For the word dog, one might predict with high confidence the neighborhood of my, walk, run, from example sentences like I walk my dog in the park, or my dog likes to run. Such a prediction is given in the form of a vector of probabilities, with a probability score assigned to each word in the corpus. This is the vector used for the word to vec embedding. When instead of sentences or strings of words, we have strings of node labels, the same idea applies. We simply pass our list of node neighborhoods into a standard word to vec model. Then the model returns for each node in the graph, a vector of probabilities. The probabilities estimate the chance of visiting a given node B in a random walk starting with the target node. We will now consider an implementation of one random walk method in Python. To determine our random walk, we might decide on a fixed path length and simply assign equal probabilities to each edge in the graph. This strategy is commonly known as deep walk. Here, we will consider a more flexible alternative called node to vec. The node to vec algorithm allows us to balance features from neighborhoods at both local and global levels. This balance is struck by two key parameters, P and Q. P decides whether we will return to the previous node in the walk, and Q decides the ratio between local versus global search. Imagine a walker came from the green source node and has arrived at dest. The walker will have a 1 over P weighted chance to return to the original source node. With weight 1, the walker may explore locally in the immediate neighborhood of source, which here is node 1. And with probability 1 over Q, the walker may move more globally towards S2 or S3, which are not direct neighbors of source. We can think of the weights in the diagram as unnormalized probabilities. Increasing P reduces the chance of returning to source, and increasing Q reduces the chance of exploring globally. In this, we see that a low P produces BFS-like behavior, and a low Q produces DFS-like behavior. Using this diagram, we can begin to code our method, get edge prob, which takes our newly defined parameters P and Q. Upon returning, we will have a list of the transition probabilities to each neighbor of dest, given that our last move was to traverse the edge from source to dest. The list will be ordered by sorting the neighboring node labels. For each of the destination's neighbors, we simply check, is this neighbor the source? If so, we assign the probability 1 over P. That's if the neighbor is a direct neighbor of the source, and we assign a probability of 1. Lastly, if the neighbor is further from the source, then we assign a probability of 1 over Q. Before returning, we need to be sure to normalize the probabilities, dividing by their sum. And we do that here. Now we can write a quick method called get edge probs, which takes all the probabilities in the graph into consideration. We just iterate through each possible edge, and if the graph is undirected, we assign probabilities both ways. We return a useful dictionary with edge tuples as keys. Now with this in place, we can write our walk method, which takes a walk length, a start node, and our familiar P and Q parameters. We can begin by computing all edge probabilities since this remains fixed throughout the walk. Starting with the start node, we iterate up to the walk length, making our decision on which neighbor to visit next. If the walk has just begun, we can allow a uniform distribution on the neighbor probabilities. Otherwise, we just look to our last move to find the distribution from the edge probabilities that we have computed earlier. Our last procedure is simulate walks, which will allow us to iteratively perform these random walks across the graph, starting at each node once with random order. Then we will shuffle the order and iterate again, up to the parameter num walks, recording each walk as an array of length walk length. With this in place, we are ready to test our node vec implementation on a real graph. Let's load a built-in copy of Zachary's famous Karate Club network. To better visualize this graph and its communities, we will use Durbin Newman hierarchical clustering and color the nodes according to their cluster. Here is the graph we will be working on. Now we can write a method to simulate 128 sets of walks, with one walk per node per set. We will allow walk lengths of 15 and parameters p equals 1 and q equals 2, balancing more towards BFS behavior. We feed these walks directly into our word to vec model with an embedding size of 2 so we can plot our results on an xy grid. When we produce a scatter plot of the embedded nodes, we see that the Gervin Newman communities have been preserved and are nicely clustered in the embedded space. This is our desired outcome. With that, we can call our implementation a success. To wrap things up, I'm going to talk a little bit about graph representation methods that are based on deep learning. In a deep learning methodology, we attempt to learn a function f from an input space x to an output space y. This function is a nested function consisting of a series of nonlinear transformations called layers parameterized by initially randomized weights. Here our input will be graph information. An advantage here is that we can have multiple inputs, say both adjacency matrix and a node feature matrix. Our output will be an embedding, a matrix with the nodes as columns and a low dimensional representation as the rows. Or we can use this framework to directly achieve a goal, say node classification.
There are a couple of different ways to learn our function, or train our network weights. These include supervised, unsupervised, and semi-supervised learning. In supervised learning, we have labeled data, called the training data, corresponding, for example, to a graph that has already been classified, and we try and minimize an objective function on the training data. In unsupervised learning, we try and learn an embedding or classification goal from unlabeled data. Semi-supervised learning is perhaps the most common on graphs. In semi-supervised learning, we are given some correctly labeled information, say some percentage of the nodes are already classified, and try and learn the rest of the classifications from this information. An exciting new technique in the field is graph convolutional networks. With graph convolutional networks, we want to define the network layers as transformations that focus on local structural properties. To do this, we take the definition of a convolution in Euclidean space and come up with a corresponding definition in the spectral domain of the graph Laplacian. We then approximate this convolution using a first-order neighborhood. So with a sufficiently deep graph convolutional network, we can get global communication between the graph nodes. There are many different ways to apply this technique, but in the example considered here, we use both a matrix of node features and an adjacency matrix as the input. Our goal is to learn a function from this input space to the discrete node classification space. Although we can view the node classification space as an embedding in its own right. The output will be a discrete classification that we can consider an embedding based on node classification. We will train this network using semi-supervised learning where some of the nodes are already classified. The benefits here are that we get global communication while still being able to focus on local properties, and we can encode a lot of information, and we can do this in a way that the embedding problem also is used to train on a specific goal. We can adopt this methodology for different purposes, for example, a clustering prediction, and the embedding that accompanies that. Although these networks can be somewhat black box, the benefits here are strong, and this is an exciting research area to be in. In this video, we have covered some representative techniques of the broad field that is representation learning. We hope you've gotten a little taste of the goals of the field and some of the varied ways to accomplish them. There are a lot of areas in this field, especially the deep learning based methods, that show promise and need to be explored further. Thanks for watching, and make sure to like and subscribe.